This is Jay Krishnamurti's fifth seminar with scientists at Brockwood Park, 1974. Everybody said what his profession is, what his grouping is, and uh, what his name is. And, and this summarizes the thing. It says that I belong to the group of Kashyapa and uh, student of Rukh, the branch of Vedas. And my name is Sudarshan, and uh, I greet you. Uh, I am a physicist contemplating the architecture of the world at the level of the very small and the very general. I have pursued personal intimate experience, and I have diligently tried casting my experience into a unified aesthetic pattern and thus stop the world. I have succeeded in this endeavor to the extent that I find no bifurcation between scientific and spiritual knowledge. One is with the left eye and the other with the right eye, but both seem to be needed for perspective. Science is a model, and the assertion that the model is a fair representation of the world is a hypothesis. To keep the models to size, we delimit the model, thus the role of approximation. But sometimes we extrapolate, does the world really have a relativistic, a Minkowski or a Riemannian structure? The assertion that it has is part of the limitation that we have. It is part of the approximation. As far as I can make out, knowledge acts on the individual in many ways. First, it renders the world lawful and hence comprehensible, comprehensible in terms of a few laws plus certain initial conditions. Second, it enables one to see behind the variety in a unification. We see the abstract concretized when we see a variety of phenomena. Knowledge enables us to want to see oneself as an object. It enables one to be creative, both in perspective and in communicable knowledge. And thus, it brings about transformation. When you know who you are, you are not that person. This transformation is a phase change, a cataclysmic change, which does not change the constituents, but rather the organization and the mode of functioning. The laws of nature bend to accommodate the altered existence and the standard Indian analogy is to the lotus leaf. If you are a leaf in a pond, there is very little that you can do about not being in the pond. But on the other hand, you can be like the lotus leaf. You can arrange for the water not to wet your surface. The transformation that I talk about then is primarily for oneself. It is a new perspective. It therefore creates a new world. One can choose to be outside the cause-effect chain. One is no longer bound. One lives like a warrior, to borrow a Castaneda's phrase. Absolute freedom with no need for exercising the freedom at all. No choice because all choices are equally possible. Yet one exists at many levels. One retains options and in options live alternatives and choice. It is at this voluntarily accepted option level that compassion operates. One sees another and loves another. One lives like the compassionate one. But for this, it is necessary that you see more than one. Beyond one's transformation is the transformation of those that are close to you by the flower chains of love and affection. Your student, your friend, your son, your enemy. They can be transformed, but only to the extent that you are them, to the extent that the flower chain holds. The transformation of mankind as a whole may or may not take place. The cruelty and violence of a Hiroshima seem to be surgically clean when compared with the indifference or the covert condonement of a Biafra or a Bangladesh. What is the nobility or justification for the liberalism of a professional liberal who agitates for minimum wage within the country and pursues policies that starve out countless many in other nations. If that is harmony and peace and do-gooding, we better be without it. Better the repentant tax gatherer rather than the smug Pharisee. Corruption in high places, breakdown of integrity, 
amongst academic intellectuals is the kind of anesthetic miscegenation that we must be aware of in bringing about the transformation of mankind. But where does one start? Perhaps at open-hearted meetings like this, or could they be the beginning of a new force? To me, the transformation of the other is a byproduct, a pleasant bonus. But the essence of existence is in seeing, being a rishi, being a seer. For when I see clearly, I see no other but one that is not different from myself. Then I have no neighbor, no one to transform, and no one to be compassionate to. And from direct experience, I find that when I see, even others around me seem to feel the premonitions of a transformation. Yet to be a seer is to be alone without being lonely. The route to transformation then seems to be many and yet really around is only one. When I can lose myself in contemplation of an idea or the solution to a problem, when I can listen to another or read another's work without being aware of that person's personality, when I am in an altered state of consciousness induced by meditation or by chemical stimuli, when I am lost in contemplation of my favorite deity, when I am in the presence of my master, all these are egoless trips and all these seem to me to bring about my transformation. I do not have models of why or how these transformations take place, but I tell you that there is a demonstrable and hence falsifiable sequence of events which do bring it about. I am puzzled why these radically different routes all trigger the same transformation. Perhaps sincerity is important. As Charlie Brown says, the great pumpkin will definitely come on Halloween day to the most sincere pumpkin patch. Transformation, then, as I see it, is not increasing good and reducing evil. It is going beyond good and evil. And it is said that along the way, one enhances good. That's all I wanted to say. Somebody wants to start by commenting on it? What is a sincere pumpkin patch? Well, Charlie Brown, every Halloween, sits in the pumpkin patch and uh, Lucy keeps telling him that uh, you are stupid, Charlie Brown. But Charlie Brown says, no, I mean, it is said that the great pumpkin would come to the most sincere pumpkin patch. Poor fellow is always disappointed. But the point is that in sitting in the pumpkin patch, he has more fun than all the other people, certainly more than Lucy, who knows that it will not produce any result. You spoke about uh, transformations occurring in the presence of your deity and with uh, LSD sometimes or drugs or whatever. Chemical stimuli. Chemical stimuli. <laughs> <laughs> I named it. But uh, it seems like you were saying that they occur again and again. Like you grasp something for a while and then you lose it and then again maybe you look to your deity or your master or take another pill and there you are again and uh, it, to me this doesn't seem like a real transformation if it really brings you back into uh, it feels to me that a transformation is that we are looking for and trying to see is one that is no longer seen like that. And uh, in fact, all these things, deities and masters and pills are, are hindrances because they make you believe that you have actually seen this transformation when it wasn't really the kind of transformation that is necessary. Shall I respond? Yes. I made an uh, empirical assertion that in my case, if I do certain things, certain things do happen. It happens again and again. It is, I mean, I'm willing to go into more details about what is the altered state, what is the transformed state. Now you say that if it is a transformation which has to happen again and again, it is not the true transformation. So you have some idea about what the true transformation is. 
All I say is that I know that this happens. I do not know that whether there are any other true transformations which, from which I do not dissent. I suspect if such a transformation took place, people will definitely lock me up. That if I am not able to come back to the ordinary causal world with um, recognizing things more or less as they are, it is possible, and this has happened to me at various times, that um, you could exist in a sense at two levels at exactly the same time. You function at two levels simultaneously. That you go about doing whatever you have to do. If you are driving a car, you don't um, say, well, I am Brahman, this is Brahman, and uh, the road is Brahman, and therefore let me go and crash into somebody else. But you function those things. You, if you have to teach, you teach. If you have to pay your bills, then you do those. But at the same time, and if, if you have to fight somebody, you fight them also. But at the same time, you find that all these things are not very important things, that they go on. They go on mechanically. You don't worry about it. You don't plan about it. They just happen. Now, my suspicion is that um, the only transformation that I am likely to go through, um, maybe in the foreseeable future, is one in which this um, superposition of the two states continues over an indefinite period of time that I do not have to stimulate it by one action or other. By the way, even though I mentioned all these things, I mentioned them partly because there are doctors here who might be in a better position to um, talk about why or how they are. there is a commonality between these. But uh, very often, the mood is there without you are having to resort to one thing or the other one. But these are circumstances which I identify as things which I could appeal to in case I felt that, um, you know, the battery was running down. I do not know what you mean by if you have to do it again and again, you would not do it. I mean, I have to take a bath every day and I don't say, well, I won't take it in five. So it seems to me that this is a, an altered condition, but I don't particularly have any desire to be in the altered condition alone. I would much rather be in both at the same time. I, I agree with, with what you said just at the end. I mean, there seems to, in some of us, there's a sort of tension. Um, on the one hand, we have the ordinary causal world that science is perfectly able and capable of coping with. And then we have this other transformed state, which isn't somehow better, in quotes, I mean, very loosely thinking now, um, which science can't touch. And um, there's been... I mean, people alluding to the idea that science somehow isn't wide enough in scope to cope with whatever this transformed state is. And then there are others of us who feel either perhaps we don't know what this transformed state is that in principle cannot be covered by the umbrella of science, or else it's just a false statement that science can't cover that included. And I think it, perhaps the scope and limits of science um, really ought to be discussed later on because I think there's a huge fundamental disagreement amongst us about just what the scope of science is and what it ought to be, whether it ought to cover this so-called transformed state, whether it's capable of. I mean, I think some of us have as a sort of, well, Carl said, a faith, and I think that's true, I have it. We have a faith that science is going to be wide enough in scope to cover this state, whatever it may be. Others have, I think, just as strong a faith that it, in principle, is not going to be able to cover whatever this other altered state may be. And I think that might be really the most fundamental disagreement that we share in, in this room. Does somebody want to say something to that? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I, I agree, it's worthwhile a long discussion. You, you want to have? Somebody, no, but I think we should reserve some time later in the week to discuss Well, I think the much. question may come up again. Yeah. Uh, at some other stage. Uh, yes. I would like to ask Doctor. Is the transformed state does it run in harmony with the driving the car or is it always there and you drive the car? You know what I mean? No, I'm afraid I didn't follow. I drive the car. 
there I have to exercise all my capacities on knowledge and all the rest of it. And that state, which you say, is transformation. Does it exist at the same time? It's there, only you are driving the car. Sometimes. That is, if, if one is in the, in the altered state, that altered state is, does not prevent me from functioning as an ordinary human being, including driving a car. I mentioned that as a case in which if you make a mis misjudgment, you could cause harm to other people. That uh, you could do that, you could go and teach your classes, you could go about transacting your normal duties. Do you drive the car with love? I think that's... What, sir? Do you drive the car with love? Uh, I don't know about the car, uh, <laughs> but it appears in harmony. It appears just right. You know, it's... So, you are, you are never out of that state. So, it's always m moving together. It's always like, moving together. Like there are streams. Right. There are other times when I still drive the car, and hopefully reasonably well, uh, but, but, are, but, but there are tensions. And then say, I, I don't really want to read um, Dr. Sheinberg's paper because, you know, he was really not very nice to me. And I'm not really interested in him, I'm reading his paper, but I can't read his paper without thinking of this. If there is that tension, or to say that, well, he writes this paper, but I, I have better ideas than he has. <laughs> and so why should I read his paper? Uh, there are times when you feel this one, even if you have no particular, I have nothing against him. <laughs> uh, even if you have no particular resistance against the person, if you are aware of your personality and then say that this is his and that is mine, then you have lost it. Then you have lost it. Yes. You can so, still function as a worker. Yeah, but, mm. So, to sustain or maintain or to keep it flowing, you have to have, I'm just asking, you have to have a great deal of self-knowledge, a great deal of understanding your own nature, your own, be aware of yourself and all your tricks and all your fancies, your deception, and so on, so on, so that one doesn't really cut out the other. Uh, I wouldn't want to put it that way, because I don't think I have that much knowledge about my ability to deceive myself. Uh, like everybody else, I'm quite good at deceiving myself. But those times when I get outside myself, when I feel that everything then is they right, run together. Then they run together and I don't have to worry about, now I must watch out for oh, myself, no, not no, deceiving no. myself. So, it seems to me that the way around the Gordian knot is to cut it. And the cutting is usually done by, in a sense, being there rather than going through step by step. Would you say, sir, it's like a tree having its roots deep in the earth and putting out its arms to heavens. But first you must have your roots deep in the earth. That means there must be freedom from yourself, freedom from your own anxieties, fears and troubles and all that. That is, I don't really know whether established I... in righteousness, if I can use that word without being misunderstood, and that very righteousness being established there, pushes the tree into heavens. You understand what I'm... Yes, I understand. I'm not sure I would like to either agree or disagree with you, but simply say that I don't want to use a model in which there is a time sequence. <coughs> no, I understand. Yeah. yeah, it is... If I want to think in terms of what is necessary for th bringing this about, perhaps I would say it is necessary that this be logically antecedent, that uh, I should know about myself, I should, be, I should be genuine, I should be authentic before I could function in this mode. But it seems to me that usually I know about this mode of existence by being there, not by climbing the steps, but sort of uh, without knowing about it, I am delivered there. But sir, if I am, say, frightened by I'm frightened of my wife, I'm just frightened. I can't have the other. 
I can't have the two can't run harmoniously. So obviously there must be freedom from fear. I may occasionally be afraid, but I am afraid and I will put it away. But the feeling that the two cannot exist where the fear is. Would that be right? When, uh, let me rephrase the thing and then agree with what I rephrase. <laughs> that when, <laughs> when I have fear, I am not in it. Yes. When I am in it, I do not have fear. But, but, but with fear, can you have the Allah? No, not with, but with the other, I cannot have fear also. Ah, no, 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 I am putting, if I am afraid, hmm, afraid of many things, the other thing is not possible. But the other thing cannot happen if I fear. Yes. So my concern is not the other, the other street, but the understanding of fear, the, the moving away from fear. That's my concern is not the transformation or entering into a different consciousness or different stream, but the elimination of fear. Then the other thing takes place like... Well, normally, as I'm again talking about myself, um, because it's the only laboratory I have in this case, uh, normally it seems to me it is not fear that comes in, but tension of, <laughs> of um, yes, personality interfering. Yes. Uh, the only case that I remember recently where fear was a primary thing was some couple of years ago when I had to enter a hospital for some neurosurgery. And um, when I was dropped at the hospital and I took my suitcase in and checked myself in, I really felt afraid. I wanted to get out and run away because I knew I could certainly be alive for another two weeks without any problem. And here by entering voluntarily, I mean I was signing myself away. But um, the day of the surgery, I mean, they came and said, you have to be ready within the next 10 minutes. Uh, it was, there was no problem. So it seemed to me that um, I didn't eliminate the fear because if I worried about the fear, probably I would have never been able to eliminate it. I would have really run out of the place. But I didn't worry about it and then I found that I was no longer afraid and therefore there was no problem. So it's, I mean, I, I'm only talking about myself. It seems to me that the transformation comes in not by saying that I must transform myself from this state to something else. Ah, no, ah. no, of course not. I'm only saying as long as I, there is fear, the other cannot be. The other stream or whatever you like to call it. And my chief concern then is not the other but the elimination of fear. I would say that that elimination is in fact the transformation. I, I, I don't know what, hmm. the elimination of fear is my concern. My greed, my ambition, my competitiveness, my anxiety, my jealousy, my feeling that I am better than someone. It's all, all that's included in that word for the moment. Hmm. Then, in a sense, the transformation is searching for the ways of eliminating this. I know. I'm not concerned with transformation. I'm only concerned with the with removal of this. With the, that. Yes, but you're saying they're the same. Yeah, I am saying that as far as I'm concerned, they are the same. Only thing is, I don't go about removing it. I know. I'm, uh. I'm going to it much more. I'm just using a quick word to. I think this is what I meant uh, earlier when I said we have to have an, a scientific understanding of these things. Uh, I think I understand what you're talking about after many years of thinking about the problem because in a way you're constantly talking paradoxically. You're saying the way to transform is not to transform. Quite the way to eliminate fear is to be afraid and then it will go away. I mean you're constantly dealing in paradox and there is a paradoxical logic. We haven't used it in science up to now, uh, or at least very rarely, uh, and there's no reason why we shouldn't understand how to get along in paradox. And once we have that clear, so that we, I think we'd all have an easier time following you, because 
you're constantly saying, you see. But no, that's not, we're not emphasizing transformation. We don't want to talk about transformation. That is the way to transform. And yet, but you want to get rid of fear. So the next statement I'm convinced would be, well, you pay attention to your fear. You, 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 yes, you, yes, you yes. recognize your fear. And then you tell us, well, you've got to get away from yourself. You don't want to, how do you do this? By being sure you know yourself. Yes. And it's constantly a paradox. There are paradoxical statements coming out all the time. And once you understand, deeply understand, how to deal with paradoxes of this sort, uh, then I think these things become easy. And also I'd like to ask, Doctor, aren't you concerned about others, sir? Only to the extent that I see them. You see, here I am. You see me. I'm not transformed or I'm just an average man. Aren't you concerned about me? To be quite honest, no. No. Why? Uh, there is no question of why. Because when I am in the mood when my personality or what you refer to as sphere is not interfering, then the things that I do, the things that I am caused, I mean that I am involved in, the activities that I am involved in, all are not only appearing harmonious but are harmonious. So I do the, the right thing without worrying about the fact that am I now going to do good? Am I, I, no, I don't mean that way. Huh. I don't mean that way. Your compassion for me. Yes, but that compassion is in a certain sense a spontaneous compassion. Oh, it's I not understand. something I but do. But you're concerned about me. Uh, the concern is a non-anxious concern. No, of course, huh. all that. You're concerned about hmm. me. That means you want me to transform. I want you to be with me. Yeah, I mean... If I see something... Uh, no, uh, uh, you want me to transform. You want me to get rid of my fear. You want me to have this true stream running together harmoniously. Right. That means you are concerned. If you mean concern in the non-anxious, uh, uh, loving uh, kind of, of concern, I yes, that. I am concerned. And how, do you, how does that show to me? I hope you feel a certain I, force no, I'm uh, of a affection. Dull, not an egghead, but I'm just a. <laughs> <laughs> I think you will feel it in my presence. <laughs> in my presence, you will feel that there is a t tendency is to be transformed. Want, is that all that you can do to me? You see, what I want to get at, hmm. sir, is something which is perhaps you will bear with a minute. If your consciousness is transformed, Mm. that transformation will affect the whole of consciousness of man. I do. I hope so. Uh, you, it is so. Look, Lenin, whether you agree with him or not, that's not the point. It has it affected tremendously the world. So, if you transform yourself, it is bound to affect my consciousness by your talk, by your presence, by your uh, moving about. Yes. So you are deeply concerned about me as a human being. Yes. So it's not your personal experience. Uh, I don't really know how to state this so that it is both uh, correct and um, short. It seems to me that that kind of concern, that kind of transformation, is that too is my personal experience. That if you are close to me and if my uh, um, freedom from fear is enabling you to be free from fear, that too is part of my experience. But, but I do not see an urge within me to go out and transform all no, the people no, out there. but you, it's your responsibility. You have a school like this, we have a school like this. It's my responsibility to see that this thing happens. It's my concern, my affection, my care, my attention, my love, all that. That's your concern with me. Therefore, it's your responsibility. It, therefore, it means your relationship with me. 
not according to your personal moods or this. You are responsible. I am myself not sure whether I would either lead a nation or even I, found a school. Uh, it I, seems to me I, it, the transformation that comes about is in terms of those people to whom I come in close contact. They may be only just my children, maybe only my that, students, that only the people whom I see on the street. That means you are responsible for man. Yes, but it seems to me it is a byproduct, a spontaneous byproduct. No, you are responsible. Yes, to the extent it happens. That's so, all. Therefore, you are concerned about me. Yes. Yes. Yes, to not, that. Not to, intellectually, mm. you, but concerned. No, 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 I mean, I, I agree that when I. I mean, I, the point I really wanted to bring forth is that the doing good. Uh, helping another person, the Christian virtue is in a sense a byproduct. It is not the aim. The aim is in a sense being a seer. Be I don't want to do good to me. I, do, I would horror, horror you doing good to me or helping me. But I want you to be responsible to me. I wouldn't want to put it that way, but the way you say it, I don't see any point where I could disagree with you. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't see why you gave in, because... <laughs> um, I mean, there must be thousands of people who have claimed to have undergone this transformation, whatever it may be, and they may have undergone it in a different number of variety of ways. They may have gone to India and got a guru, they may have taken pills, they may have done anything, okay? And they, now, why should someone who has undergone this transformation feel in any way responsible for anyone else? Now, I may... Responsible. Uh, the word again means two different things. You mean by responsibility the, the perverted sense that, you know, we have to take care no, of... No, and even in the able way. Yeah, just responsible. Yeah, why shouldn't I say, look, I don't give... What this state has done has elevated me so much, or brought me down some whatever, that I don't give a damn for anybody, but I'm happy and this, I'm really, I'm grooving on my state, I'm sitting here and I'm really liking it, I'm digging it, and I don't care about anybody else. Now, what's... Why wrong? not, sir? Why not? Uh, but uh, there's no answer to that, but why? That, that you don't have an answer to why. What, what why should why? I feel responsible? I feel responsible. No, but I don't, say, all right? I don't. Now, why should I feel responsible? You're missing so much. I was just saying, he's missing so much, and I'm not saying you. you know, yeah, sure, no, no. Uh, if you don't, aren't able to respond, you miss so much. Sure, as, he, as the doctor pointed out just now, there's Biafra, there's Biaf um, Bangladesh, there is uh, the destruction of Jews and Arabs and so on. Don't you feel responsible? Don't you feel? No, my, I, no. No, may I uh, interrupt here? Now? See, now he's using I, the word in my sense now. Yes, he's not. Now, I'd like to uh, bring up an issue here because there are two issues involved. I do not re feel response able to the situation in Bangladesh, for instance. I don't know how to respond. No, I said feeling of responsibility. I do not. I can't respond. I personally. You, you either. You see, and that leaves. And me what can I do? That's right. Bangladesh. Right. I can't go and feed them. I can't right. go from here over there and be a nuisance to them and right. all the rest of it. But the feeling of responsibility. Yes, that. Well, that but I, I want to know. Well. I I know what you're saying. I mean, <coughs> I mean, I could read about Bangladesh or about, of course. Uh, and and feel cons well, con even concern might be too strong. I mean, I feel angry that it's happened. I feel angry that I can't do anything. Yes, about yes, it. I feel that too. But I don't feel responsible or able. Responsible. I, I mean, responsible. no. I, in other words, I'm not spurned to any kind of action, whatever. No, because I'm, I feel that there's nothing I can do to. No, he's not talking about action. Well no, then. I, the word is, the word responsible, sir, doesn't mean to respond adequately. Ah, it does not mean that. Doesn't it mean that? To respond adequately to a challenge. 
to respond either inadequately, adequately, or totally. That, for me, that is responsible, not able to respond to inaction. That may follow. If the circumstances are right. I mean, circumstances, all the rest of it. Um, can we come back to the question of, in the state of transformation, whether one should feel responsible? I wonder whether it is that in this state uh, there's no me and there's a sense of oneness with everything, everyone. And in that state one cannot help but be responsible for everything uh, in, in relationship to everything. And so if something happens to someone else, it's bound to be a part of the movement in one's, of one's consciousness. Um, I don't know whether I respond or um, <laughs> wait for you to make an aggravating statement. That's, a, that's all I have uh, to say. No. Um, uh, you know, I've <laughs> I copied Dr. Sheinberg's uh, bad example of reading from the thing. And in the process, I seem to have you know, gone awfully fast. I made a number of rather provocative statements. Um, I said that um, as far as I'm concerned, it is possible to stop the world, that I have succeeded in stopping the world and seen it. Stopping the? World. Stopping the world, that is, of, in a sense, prevent the flux of the world from putting you into a flutter, of recognizing the thing and seeing precisely where everything is going and therefore nothing is going anywhere, that you see the things as they are. Um, now this, it seems to me, is something that is debatable. You could ask, I mean, you don't look like you have seen such a thing. <laughs> um, I have asserted that uh, it seems to me that science is a model and therefore since everything about the world is a model that I don't see any difference between science and um, what may be vaguely called spiritual or mystical or any other kind of knowledge. That in fact I see a continuity that um, uh, when Dr. Pribram talks about um, everything would be included within science. Uh, and somebody else uh, might object and then say, no, we think something could not be put in science, uh, science and other things. Uh, it seems to me that I'm making a very definite partial statement saying that, uh, look, I think that I see no di distinction between the two, that it is simply a matter of method of going about doing things. And even with regard to the thing, one is going about empirically. You, you've observe yourself even when you are in this most harmonious state. You observe when you are not in that harmonious state. You ask the question, what did I do? What did I have for breakfast before I got into this state? What are the conditions? What are my responses to things when I, before I get into this particular condition? I said about transformation, that transformation is in fact this um, unpleasant sounding word, holistic view that uh, of harmony without Harmony and, and compassion or connection without being, um, you know, doped out, without being uh, unable to do anything, that you function as a normal individual and yet, I mean, you see distinctions in the effect that you can drive your car through busy traffic, but you do not see distinctions in the sense that there is a you and a me and which are separated. And that when such an existence is possible, that is the transformation. The transformation is in the possibility that uh, you are able to function uh, at a level where you can have compassion without at the same time making it impossible for you to live. And um, that I personally do not feel that transforming other people is part of my job, but it appears that when I am transformed, that when I feel harmony, that those around me get an inkling of the thing and perhaps they too are transformed to a certain extent. That if there are several who are being in this mood at the same time, then it looks as if the trip is more worthwhile. And that uh, there are certain conditions, certain sequence of events, like doing, uh, giving a very good lecture, um, listening to somebody who is expounding something, discovering something, coming across um, a very aesthetic moment, of being in the presence of someone who is so obviously uh, attuned with uh, the world at large, 
that some of it rubs off on you. In contemplation of something which, in which you are not involved, you do things. I mean, the phrase that um, Dr. Sheinberg used about um, running is sacred. There are sacred activities that one engages in, which are precise, done as a ritual, but which are aesthetic and in which, from which no, nothing is expected in return. It is in the action itself that everything is complete. And uh, it's, I did say something about Biafra and other things, only to say that to me, the, the state of the world as a whole, I mean, as newspapers would um, describe it, seems not to move me as much as the plight of myself, of those whom are, who are close to me, the problems of lack of integrity in high places. These things bother me very much more than the population problem or the fact that in India there is going to be starvation. And um, to me, the creation of the bomb is really much less important than the fact that we could callously ignore somebody being stabbed in, um, uh, in a New York um, apartment house area or um, uh, people could starve and we know that they are starving and not feel concerned that something is wrong with the policy which brings this about. So I thought I had kept myself so completely open on all sides, uh, but uh, nobody seems to attack me except Krishnaji. <laughs> uh, maybe nobody feels well, up to it. <laughs> maybe this is a, a little attack, but I'll attack myself too. Uh, reverting to the very important matter of fear, uh, you raised the question of uh, having some feeling of resentment about on a matter of scientific priority. Um, now, uh, isn't the basis for that resentment, I mean, really f fear? I mean, I certainly have had these feelings too, which uh, I think nearly all of us in, in science at some time have, ex have experienced these distressing feelings about recognition or priority, irrespective of how much recognition we ever get. We, and I think the basis is fear, that one is afraid that other people will not approve of one. One is afraid that they will find out how stupid you are. And one is afraid that, um, well, one can go on with a long list. But why, why should one worry about such matters, really? One always tries not to, one always does. Uh, I'll give an example. A few days ago, uh, in the American supermarket, I saw a book by Bob Danikin, uh, something about gods, I mean, chariot of God, not chariot of gods, one of the later chariot, one of the later gods. And um, the book does say that, you know, I mean, the, the tra transport of people from other planets or other civilizations is now not only possible but feasible and said that, well, physicists have now started talking about possibility of propagation faster than light. And I don't particularly think von Däniken is a very good critique of physics or uh, a person who should award credits. But I found that um, the person who is referred to there as having initiated this hypothesis was a man who uh, simply plagiarized my work six years after it was published in an American journal. Now, I don't really expect that uh, somebody is going to disapprove of me if this is not there, but it took all the pleasure out of me. I spent a dollar and twenty-five cents to buy this book, <laughs> and it took all the pleasure out of me, and I did not read the book further beyond that particular point. I hope to read it when I have more strength, maybe after this conference. But it was a compliment. <laughs> it was a compliment, but it, was, uh, it made me unhappy. Now, I don't really see why I should feel unhappy, because it is... Uh, well known in our circles that this was a case of um, sheer robbery. But why should I now be concerned about the thing? Because my job is secure, my reputation hopefully is secure, and uh, the people who read it probably wouldn't know about my having done it, but they are not the ones who are going to take care well, of me. How do you account for it then? I don't know. I don't know. I, I am ashamed of having to admit it, but these are um, psychiatrists, so it's all right to mention this here. <laughs> <laughs> This like, this is very. I find this interesting. I mean, isn't it like coming home, say after this conference, and finding your house or your flat has been robbed? You know, and you say, "Oh, I'm feeling upset. It's terrible." And then saying, as we're suggesting, well, "Why should we feel upset? I mean, after all, they're only belongings. Damn it all! We're justified in feeling upset. 
just as I think you're justified in feeling upset if suddenly you find an idea of yours plagiarized and used to add someone else's gain. And I think there's some kind of... Uh, well, it starts off as intuitive, but perhaps if, you know, if one thinks about it, we could be a little bit more systematic about it. There's an intuitive sense of justice which we feel is being violated when these sorts of things happen. I don't think that's quite it. Excuse me. Mm. But again, but it, it comes back to the fear, and I've been trying to think of what it is that we're afraid of. And since most of us are males, uh, at least I'm not sure this applies to the female, it has to do with a sense of territoriality. Uh, this is mine. You, well, see, so that, you, just you said, weren't afraid, were you, when you saw you were angry? No, was, oh, but there's, yeah. a, there's a deeper meaning to territoriality, I'm sure. sure. I think males especially can't handle, uh, uh, at least easily handle, and this is true of, of some uh, non-human primates, uh, can't handle a lot of disharmony or information, or whatever word you want to put, novelty, simultaneous. So we put boundaries, and we say, this is mine, and, and we organize and order everything within a certain perimeter. And then we sort of can feel comfortable. And I think one of the things that happens when you come home, which means to you territory, which means to that orderliness, within which you can feel comfortable and exist almost, has been disrupted. And so it is a fear that you're going to go to pieces. I think it's a much deeper fear than just of prestige or this or that. It's a deep fear of disruption because you need orderliness around you in order to function. You feel that justice or injustice has nothing to do with this? Yeah. Well, those are, I think, ways of talking about something that has to do with this orderliness. <coughs> hmm. A theory, I, I mean, the brain theories that I talk about, the reason I have to have them in a sense is, is the facts come at me in such uh, rapidity and in such disarray that unless I can organize them some way, uh, I have trouble. And so I organize them knowing full well that the map that uh, I use is incomplete and mm -hmm. so on. And then I, I live with it. Oh, wow. well, I must be uh, ordering the universe that you're talking about. I'm coming to yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, uh, I don't think the major problem here uh, is, is one of injustice or territoriality, although perhaps both play a part uh, in connection with uh, Dr. Sudarshan's uh, uh, honest uh, uh, statement about the, the way he feels uh, concerning this plagiarism. Uh, it seems to me that, that, that he's touching on a basic aspect uh, of all human existence, which is that um, uh, our own existence is defined by other people. And in a basic sense, we're absolutely nothing uh, by ourselves, and our, our identity is, is defined by the meaning that we have for other people. And if that is shut off, uh, it's a threat. Even, it, and the threat here was symbolic because this was, this was shutting off some potential area where your own identity could have been defined, should have been defined by a broader range of readers of this particular book who would have appreciated you as a person. And you should be appreciated for the efforts you do. So do you say that one is aware of one's transformation? Or... Some rare cases you are even aware of the fact that something is happening to you. Yes, but I'm just asking, can you say for instance, if one is vain, you cultivate humility. It's not humility. But the disappearance of vanity brings quite a different state, of which you cannot say, I am humble. So in the same way, is transformation recognizable? Which means, just means, which means you have had it already before, and therefore you recognize it. Therefore it's in the time sequence and all the rest of it. Therefore it's not transformation. Uh, I don't know if I'm... 
I am glad you mentioned this because this is something I should have mentioned that the remarkable thing about the transformation is that when you find yourself in these extraordinary states, they are not unfamiliar. They are extraordinary, but they are not unfamiliar. That means you already had it. If one has to think in terms of memory, yes. Of course. Therefore, it's not new. Perhaps it was there all the time. Uh, that we go back to the old mm -hmm. theory, God is within his soul, you know all that. But <laughs> I'm just trying to find out. No, I don't. What I'm saying is that it is not unfamiliar. Not because I am remembering, yes, I had this before. It is not unfamiliar. It is, uh, I don't know how exactly to say it. There are certain conditions in which you enter a new field or uh, look at a certain problem. You have never, or talk to a new person, you have never met them before. But in no time at all, you suddenly realize that it's as if you had known them all your life. Now, if Barring reincarnation and various other things, it seems to me that the best thing to say is simply to state it without asking, why is it that I know? There are theories I have heard about, why is it that you know, namely because you are, you have always been that and you didn't know it and yes, now you I know. know. <coughs> but wouldn't it be right to say, I don't know? No, I know, I'll put it differently. It is not describable. Yes, I agree, completely. It is not... It cannot be put into words, because words are not the thing, description is not described, so it cannot be put into words. All that can be put into words is my fear, my fear, my all that. And nothing, the other, is not measurable in terms of thought. Yes. So it cannot be achieved. It cannot be achieved, but... Wait, wait, um, no. it can, through a pill, through a guru, through a company, through uh, satsang and all the rest of it, it cannot be achieved. Practice, data. Because the moment you achieve, you already know. And therefore it's... What is known is still within the part of the area of thought. That, I think, is where I would definitely disagree with you. Because that premise I simply do not accept. That which is known need not be within the realm of thought. I, I cannot describe it, I cannot even... Therefore, I cannot describe it. I cannot put it into words. And it cannot be... And yet you so beautifully do so all the time. No. <laughs> Therefore, it, it is something not recognizable. It is because it's fresh all the time. It's new all the time. I, I'm using quick words to convey something. It's like God being God, quote, God being with you when you know it not. But when you know it, it's not God. I'm, so, I am afraid I don't agree with your choice of words. Um, I, I, please, I, I agree. I'm using very quick to convey something. Uh, I would like to say it is not unfamiliar, but I do not want to make it correspond to recognizable. Uh, I agree that it is something which was not different from you because in a sense you are not unfamiliar with it. I don't want to say that it is, can be stated in words, described in words or um, communicated to another person through normal means. I do not want to say it cannot be communicated at all. Um, I do not want to say that it cannot be thought of though I suspect that it cannot be put into thought form either. But it is familiar. You. Uh, not recognize, not identify, you are with it. And when you are with it, you know you are with it. I, I am not with it. Mm -hmm. That's my whole point. I don't, ex I don't exist when the other is. Yes, I, there I s agree. And therefore, there is no question of putting it into thought. There is nobody to that, put it into that's, thought. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. I, 
if I may go into it a little bit, I have noticed I may be cuckoo, I may be nut or anything like that. Meditation, if we go into that a little bit, must be new each time, new in the sense the happening there is totally new each time. At least I've found it. New in the sense I, it hasn't happened before. Therefore, I can't say I'm familiar with it. Could you say you are unfamiliar with it? No, I wouldn't say either. Because I, it's some, it's, I am not there. That's my point. <clears throat> Otherwise, it can't take place. Yes, but then how do you justify saying, I, it, I, every time it is new? How would you know if you are not there? That's the whole problem. I, ha I submit that uh, we are probably using different words but saying roughly the same. You, you say you would not say it is unfamiliar, so I say no, it is I not would, unfamiliar. I would say it's not familiar. Even I am willing to say that. <laughs> it is not unfamiliar, but maybe I would strengthen it and then say it is not familiar also. It is fresh, it is always new, and yet it is not unfamiliar. It's very difficult, this thing. First of all, sir, words cannot describe it. Right. Knowing for myself, the world is not the thing. So the mind is not slave to words. That's I'm conveying as quickly as possible. Perhaps using wrong words, but you'll capture what I'm trying to. And what says it is new? That's the whole point. What is the quality of mind says, this I have not seen before. Not I seeing it anew. The thing is new. How is that newness registered? Isn't it? All that I know is what I have experienced before or um, seen before. That's all I can say. In terms of what I've seen before, which is my knowledge of experience and so on and so on, the, the new, it happens. And I say, but Joe, it's so, i suddenly aware that something has happened totally different from anything that has happened before. May I try to yes, again, yeah. bring this into science? Focus. <laughs> uh, well, uh, just uh, it isn't exactly the same thing, but it approaches it. Yesterday, uh, David Bohm said uh, uh, this business of first quantization and second quantiz quantization, and uh, in, in terms of first quantization being a holographic representation, and second quantization being some taking the intensity uh, at every point and doing a hologram on that, and that's the second quantization. Now, that was totally new to me. I'd never begun to think in these terms, and yet immediately I recognized, in a sense, and again the word has to be used carefully here, uh, that it was right, it fitted data that I was very familiar with, it was totally new, and yet extremely familiar. Uh, it was the simplicity of it, well, of course, and it wasn't even in my field, uh, and yet I had a, a certainty about it that it really is. So it happens, I think, in, in our scientific in the production of science, we have very similar... Well, how is it that when we write something, 
which we ourselves are producing, for instance, but could we I say it isn't right. Until, yes, so, so somewhere, there must be that pre-recognition or precognition. Could I say, I don't know? I don't know. Not that I expect you to tell me or give me the answer, or I'm waiting to find out. I really don't know. Full stop. Mm -hmm. I don't move any further. Well, we do say that as well. Inwardly, I, I know nothing. And only in that state, I, and not state, you know, in that not knowing something new can happen. But if I keep on recognizing, being familiar, saying, yes, I've had this before, it is, etc., etc., it, it's the continuity of the old thing well, again, in a different form. Yeah, again, you take it to the extreme, whereas I think our experience is in limited form. We say we can understand something up to a certain point, at which point we say we really don't know. And once having accepted that, Yet we seem to recognize something mm. totally new as being the right solution to the not knowing, as if we had known all along mm. that something about it. <coughs> well. may, may I just finish what? I mean, people have said there is God. Catholics have said it, Hindus have said it in different ways. And you, I say, I, I reject all. And I say, I don't know. And I mean, I mean I don't know. Not I'm waiting for you to tell me or I'm going to find a royal experience. I don't know. Blank. Blank sheet of paper. Then in that sheet can be written something. Not my conditioning or your conditioning or the propaganda of the Catholics or the Hindus. It is abnegation of the entire thing. Because I'm not afraid. I don't, I don't care if God exists or doesn't exist. But the, the mind that says, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's too, yes, and I think that if it were good. I want to use your uh, idea that it, uh, this entire cognitive uh, structure doesn't work. You see that uh, it really, uh, if you really mean that you don't know, <laughs> that you know, and what you were talking about. But now um, you were next, weren't you? Well, I think uh, I wanted to say very similar things what you just said, but um, in a sort of different way because I've made the experience in doing research in science that you come across experiences which are in some way similar to meditative experiences when you have a new insight. Now, if you, uh, Dr. Primram, if you say that why is it that something is familiar, no, how did you say it, why is it something is completely new to me and yet I know it fits? Right. I think it's, it's simply that what is new to you is just a certain combination of patterns or inputs or elements, but you know the elements because you know what an amplitude is and you know what a hologram is. It's just the way David Bohm put them together for you in that conversation. That was new. And this is, I think, typically what happens when you do research in science, that you, you take everything in, all the information, and then you have to have that moment, that intuitive moment, where the mind, not the rational mind, but the intuitive mind, makes some new connection. And we all, we who do science, we all know that this typically happens not when you work on your desk, but when you take a shower, when you walk in the woods and so on. Then you make this connection. And in that moment, this is a sort of a meditative, direct, immediate insight. However, I think what Krishnamurti is talking about is different because in the sense that in that case, the mind is empty in the first place and not filled with concepts. And so although there is a certain similarity, there is a difference. And this, I think, is the reason why 
the, the scientific meditative insight is always limited to very short instances, whereas the true meditation can go for longer periods, because the mind is empty. You mean simple, in the simple sense of in time, short, like two seconds? Yeah, right? yeah, even shorter than that, fractions of a second. Yes, that you want to... So hasn't it happened to you, at the end of the day, you recollect what has happened during the day, and at the end of the day, before, as you sleep, wipe out the sleep, mm -hmm. so that when you go to sleep, the mind is, etc., has order, creates its own order, and and all the rest of it. We won't discuss it. So, when you, when the mind is really doesn't know, not pretending, mm -hmm. not waiting for an answer, not hoping to experience, and so on, so on, absolutely blank, which is meditation, to empty the mind of all its problems. That's real meditation, at least that. <laughs> and that cannot be achieved through drugs, through masters, through mm, incense, through recitation, through repetition of mantras and so on, and that's out. Then, in that complete not knowing, what happens is written on the page. Then the eyes can read it. Then I say, Pacho, that's new. You follow, sir? Not that I recognize it as new, but it, I've never read, read that sentence before. Because it's the sheet has been blank and something has written on it. But to be able to say that I have never read it before, the memory should be operating at this point. Ah no, it is blank. And I wake up and see something is written on it. But when you wake up and read it and say, I had not seen it before. Because my mind was empty. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I don't agree with you or I don't follow you or probably both. I hope we don't follow me. Uh, um, <laughs> because uh, in terms of scientific creativity, this happens all the time, that you abandon a particular project, you are no longer keep it in mind, and then when you least expect it, something happens. Okay, that's and uh, like pulling a root out, um, uh, plant out, and then it turns out that there's long, long roots, you gradually raise it up and like um, uh, pulling and in the line the, and… Kill the plant. Kill the plant, because <laughs> it's a weed. I mean. You, you find that, in fact, in this particular fashion, you are able to unearth a whole lot of things which could not have been contained right. with it. Right. But this is possible because you still function as a scientist. You have not forgotten differential equations. You have not forgotten what was the problem that you no, were sir, worried about. I'm, I'm approaching it, if I may, as a human problem. I've got problems. I've, my wife, I have to earn money, I have to uh, quarrel, I have this and that. I, I, you follow, I'm talking about that field, not the scientific field. I think, symbol, I think what we're arguing about is that we're saying, in a limited sense, not as completely as I you, but the process seems to be, at least in our experience, somewhat, it's similar. somewhat similar. I understand that, sir, but yeah, as, a human, are as a human being, right, that's my right. problem. Yeah. Right. I, we, we are burdened with problems. Right. And to end them each day, not superficially, deceptively, or cunningly, end them. So that my mind said, I don't know, I will finish. It's empty each time. So Cup is useful only when it's empty. Sorry, I'm going to ask one thing. Raise one point. Uh, see, the, the question which might be in uh, many people's minds is how one knows what it means to say it's new when we don't recognize, we don't compare it with the past. I say there's something very uh, crucial here that, in some sense, the quality of newness, uh, it seems to me, is, is perceived without comparison to the past. But there's a direct quality of newness. 
in which case you are using language quite differently. It, in, instead of newness, one is talking about freshness. The same word. Uh, no, but what I'm saying is that it is not that you know that it was not there before. It is a quality in itself. That's what you I take milk and then say this is good milk. You don't say that this is not the milk that I didn't drink before. You say that this is, this is uh, fresh. It is not gone stale. It isn't like that. I have emptied my mind. On this problem? Oh, no. You see, uh, I guess I speak for almost everybody here. We empty our mind about one set of problems, maybe a complex of problems. I I'm mean, um, Dr. Sheinberg problem. insults me and I forget about it the next day, uh, almost immediately. But I still don't forget the fact that I have to go to London if I uh, want no, to no, get no. a plane. No, 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 that's understood. Mm -hmm. I have finished, emptied my mind of pleasure, which is which has gone into great deep fear, identity with my self or with my family, with my house, it is mine, it is not mine, it's completely gone down the shore. Sorry. So again, the paradoxical use of words. New is also... I am not sure so it's paradoxical. No, I, I think that uh, we have to learn to use words in a different way. I'm, I'm, See, I'm, I'm a layman, I use all many words. But new, as, as David Bohm has just said, in ordinary sort of linear kind of talk, linear, yes. something can't be new if we don't recognize the old. Oh, quite you quite have just said to us yes. I know that, that it is really fresh and fresh, new, yes. and yet we don't wreck it isn't. I understand. And, and that's the paradox. I, I wonder if one. One way of trying to resolve it, and hopefully not confuse it more. I think what is familiar is the context, the way that we are as a state when we know this new thing, which is a content that we are aware of. What's familiar is the way that we are in knowing, but what we know is always new. We're in a special state of organization, we are, um, well, I can't say it any more clearly than that. <laughs> we should have a televised. <laughs> can, we, can one relate this to the question that came up in the morning about making images? If I, if I look at a glass of milk, and if I don't have any image of milk in my mind, then this glass of milk, this milk has a certain freshness. But if I, if I have my image of milk, I, I won't even look at it and say, well, okay, that's a glass of milk, I know it anyway. And there's a difference. That implies, man, that implies, doesn't it, sir? I'm attached to my belief. I'm attached to my conclusions. I'm attached to my uh, ideals, prejudices, and so on, so on. I'm attached. And therefore, there is nothing fresh, I won't use the word new. As he said just now, yeah, I go home and my things are stolen. It's a nuisance. If I have money, I get more, but it doesn't destroy me. Mom, the attachment is the problem. to my image, to my uh, desires, to, uh, you know this. Well, I, I went, it was actually a bit along those lines too that I felt that what Krishnaji is pushing at is, is something more profound, um, wiping clear than that in science, or even uh, because it involves this wiping clear of one's own attachments and, I mean, a scientist being attached to his work or to his belongings. It's, it's something deeper than, than just a scientific kind of... Maybe there are parallels, but... Uh, it's deeper, but it is the same, on the same dimension. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Sir, yes. so I, I don't... I, <coughs> I like cars, motor cars. 
But I, I look at them. I'm not attached. I don't even want to buy. I mean, I drive a lovely car. I like to go fast. But attachment, you see, that's where I want to find out where desire becomes attachment. Therefore, I have to go into the question of sensation, contact, sensation, desire. Can the mind stop there? And not go further. I must have it. That requires tremendous inward attention or discipline or whatever you have to use. So that you're always seeing and not getting attacked. So I say it's, uh, we should, uh, it's about ten minutes to five now, if we could finish up in a few more Could minutes. I, uh, I just say, I think the trouble with scientists is, of course, they are attached to their ideas. Mm-hmm. That's one. Yes. Yes. And the freshness comes when one loses the attachment, not the commitment necessarily, but the attachment. But can, I, but, yes, sir, can I live in this world without attachment? In the pejorative sense that you've used it, yes. I mean, every day, not <laughs> in a special field. Every day of my relationship with my wife, I'm married to her, mm-hmm. my money, with my job, completely not attached. That is the philosophy of life, which is love of truth, which is to to be detached. How could you be detached and responsible at the same time? You said before Detachment, you were... I mean you are detached, you are totally responsible. Totally responsible? Yes. Uh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I... Once you get into this paradox... No, on the contrary, sir. When you are detached, it means that you really love and therefore you are responsible. You care, you all the yeah. What is this self which is detached from things? Self is my furniture, my prejudices, my uh, opinions, my gods, my nations, my family, my house, my polished furniture, which is 7th, 16th century, which has followed. <laughs> and I. That, that is, is me. You speak of being detached, but no, what, what that is, is me. That is you. Yeah. You detach that. I, you that detach is me. Yeah. When I say that, I possess that. That is me. The furniture is me. So the detachment is, is, is removal of self, of you. <laughs> well, yes. there's uh, one very practical thing. What seems to happen in human behavior, or animal behavior for that matter, is what's called the means ends reversal. That initially. Uh, there is a, something is undertaken in order to achieve something like eating or what have you. But as the skill becomes more and more, and this can be a perceptual skill as well as or a thought skill as well as an action skill, uh, as that develops, uh, it becomes easier and easier to achieve the end and the means begins to take on more and more of the act, of the Sir, activity. You, you're still, if I may say, yes. you're still thinking in terms of achievement, it's gradually. Yes. Oh yes, I'm simply saying what takes place, and then the end becomes the the means. No, I'm I'm trying to say, sir. Yeah. Is freedom from attachment a gradual process? Or instant. Well, I wasn't thinking so much of the freedom from attachments as how the attachment takes place. Oh, that's very I was simple. I'm attached because I'm empty. I'm, without my furniture, I'm lost. Without my house, I'm lost. Without my wife, I feel lonely, and so on, so on. I fill up, fill myself with all this, and I, all that is me. Then I'm attached. Okay. And. Is that attachment gra- to freedom from a gradual process or 
instant. I'm afraid I, I really don't understand uh, most of this. I, I mean, maybe I'm stupid, but I don't. I mean, you're not your furniture. You're you, and your furniture is the furniture. And I could individuate the furniture from no, you. No, but when I'm attached to it. Of course, yes, but you said in reply to Pete's question that you are your furniture. No, when I'm, at, when I'm attached to my belief, to my conclusion, to my furniture, to my prejudices, to my nation, I am all that. You could hold a set of beliefs and attitudes, etc., about various things. You could also have possessions, but those beliefs, attitudes, possessions, etc., are precisely those. They're not you. Who is you, then? Oh, well, that's, I mean, I'd, I'd love to talk for hours about what I think the self is, but that, I mean, whatever I am, whatever we are, whatever the self is, it's not those sorts of things which we accumulate, be they, be they ideas. What are you, sir, otherwise? Words? Opinions? Conclusions? Those are things we hold. They're not well, us. The content makes consciousness. Without the content, where is consciousness? I'm, just, look, my, I'm only claiming that, I mean, in simple Aristotelian logic, for example, we have the distinction between a subject and a predicate. And the, and the subject is that which possesses predicates. But it's not the predicate itself. I mean, it's not the subject itself. There are, um, now, if what, I mean, trying to translate what you're saying to understand, I mean, you, surely you're not saying that the subject in Aristotelian logic is nothing but an agglomeration of predicates. You can't say that because, that, I mean, that's so just... I would like to, if I may, mm. may I, without <clears throat> my country, without my prejudices, my superstitions, fears, pleasures, all that, what am I? Well, on one level, I could say you are a, uh, in a, a bundle of neural fibers, etc. Yes, so I'm trying to give that sort of description. Uh, is there all? That's all. If, if I'm just res the response of new hmm. nerves and so on, that's very simple. Hmm. But I'm not, we don't limit hmm. the me to but that. But you see, if I say that um, that which, as it were, underlies and possesses all those things which you mentioned, I'm not thereby identifying the supporting thing with all the with all the possessions. We are not identical. That's my. And if you're claiming that they're identical, then I, I don't understand. Only, um, only when they're attached, then they become identical. And I was trying to give the means ends reversal uh, as the what happens when people become attached. They be they initially start out toward an end. The means take over. And they become the means, as it were. The means sort of occupies so much of their consciousness, aware, what, whatever word we want to use, that it becomes them. But it seems if and you want to, people will commit suicide. If yeah. I mean, I, people I, have to take out patents, and somebody steals the patent, I understand. Or something, and they'll slice yes. their throats because they have been destroyed. But that, but but look. You could, I mean, we say, and everyone understands, that um, X possesses a patent, which, okay, which he holds dearly. But then if we shift from that sort of talk to the sort of talk which says that X was or is his patent, we're just talking metaphor. But we don't really mean X is his patent. Oh, but the point is, yes, but you see, you're using, that's my whole point about understanding Krishnamurti here. I think that if you use it to as Aristotelian logic, you, you will only hear his words and not what he's saying, which is always formulated in a different kind of logic, a paradox. I am my possessions, but I am not. And I, you see, it's, it's this continual, almost uh, the, the, the formal way I've learned to talk about it is in terms of paradoxical logic, that everything is framed in terms of a paradox. So am I, am I the form, the body, the mind, the mind which is all prejudice conditioning? My answer is yes and no. <laughs> all right, if, if you take away all that from me, yes. which is death, right. well, I'm nothing. Yes and no. <laughs> what about all those students? 
And the next thing you say, uh, so the answer cannot be yes or no. no. It has to be yes no, and sir, no. no. Look, I, I can understand that you, you're trying to, as it were, order these statements in terms of a paradoxical logic, yes and no, and therefore violating all sorts of basic and primitive laws, etc. But my concern is not just with understanding this paradoxical logic, because one could say yes and no. I mean, does Krishnamurti possess a table? Yes and no. In other words, the paradox could apply both to what I understand, but also to what I don't understand. What I don't understand is the movement from saying generalized X possesses X, Y, Z, to X is X, Y, Z. That, to me, because perhaps because I don't understand, is an invalid form of argument, and therefore, because it's not... I mean, it's so obviously invalid that I must not be able to... I must not well, be comprehending what... Except that it leads to suicide, which is incomprehensible yeah. also. Oh, no, I understand. I mean... Could you say that we are, uh, this argument is based on different ways of using uh, words and thinking, you know, and using language, and... Uh, uh, you see, there is a, a, pre, a presupposition in our culture that this particular logic is the only possible uh, way of thinking, which has been sort of conditioned into us. Now, uh, so in order to be able to uh, resolve this thing, see, one has to be able to listen to another way of, uh, of looking at it, uh, which is not the customary way that we accept in our culture commonly. And... Uh, <coughs> Uh, and uh, in this other way of looking at it, in some sense, the self, I think Krishnamurti is saying, in some sense, what we call the self, not, uh, not just the body, but its soul or psychological essence, is actually this set of qualities. And if this set of qualities is gone, there would be no self. This is the way I understand it. He is implying that. Now, whether you agree with it or not is at the moment not the point. You see that the first point is just simply that we listen and try to understand each other. Oh, I listened, but I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that's the first point. Could I, could I make a suggestion that, uh, I mean, it's a technical thing, which is maybe not, not appropriate this time, but I think when quantum mechanics came along, people were prepared to make a revision in the way they thought about the world. And to, to say that maybe Aristotelian logic wasn't the only way of thinking about things having hmm. properties. And yes, but then... Maybe we should be prepared you know, to make the same... Of course, of course, but the onus was then on the quantum theoreticians to give us a logic which transcended the old logic. Well, now, wasn't, wasn't it really on experience? I mean, oh, no, I mean, there were certain basic axioms in formal that were dropped, you know, that they purposely had to drop. Um, well, we, well, but, you know, so in other words, they did. They, now there's a formalized quantum logic. Well, that was my idea that maybe if we can make some real contribution scientifically here in understanding in real, you know, in some way of altering our Western way of talking, thinking about these problems that would make you understand as I feel I do. I may be, you know, I may be misunderstanding, but I feel I understand what Christian Morty was saying that if we could formalize those properties so that you could, as a, as a logician, could mm. understand them, then I think we would have Great. reached some, mm. something that yes. uh, is very valuable. Look, I, what, what, my, what, my remarks were made because, I, you know, I was asking, as it were, for help towards, as it were, formalizing those sorts of remarks well, to I give think, them sense. Because yes, well, I think that perhaps that could best be done in some other context because, you know, it's difficult to do that here, but... Uh, uh, I, I just add one point that I, in my view, the, even to understand the quantum mechanics, one will have to give up the kind of logic you were discussing and to look at things in a rather similar way to what Krishnamurti was talking now. But as perhaps we'll leave this aside, and I think uh, Fritsch wants to say something. I was, uh, I'm very interested in this question of, of paradox in, in uh, Physics and I compare to the paradoxes in Eastern philosophy, especially in, in Zen Buddhism, and I talk about quantum koans, which I because I compare the koans in Zen to the koans the founders of the quantum theory had. Uh, but in this particular case, I don't see any paradox. This is not one case which I would quote as an example. And I think you cannot always just when you don't understand things just say, well, this is a paradox, and we have to to modify our, our logic. We have to be a little careful, I think, when we evoke these, these paradoxes. I think the paradoxical nature is, is very characteristic of, of 
uh, if you want to call it mystical experience, and it is also very characteristic of modern physics, but you cannot always invoke it. For instance, this example of, of the self being associated with all the feelings, thoughts, ideas, and so on, I don't have any trouble in understanding it. I had trouble in the past, but I don't have any trouble now, and I don't think it's paradoxical at all. Associated with, but not identical to, or are these the same sort of relation? Well, once, once you don't, you're free from all that, then you don't have any self any longer, it's just gone. So it is identical. Well, I think uh, if we could uh, sort of defer this discussion, perhaps it would be best take place informally. And uh, there was one more person who had a question. Was that you? No. Then uh, I think maybe we'll call this uh, meeting to a close and start tomorrow morning at the usual time. <coughs>